quantum numbers. That's going to be the topic of this lesson. And we'll find out that every electron in an atom has an address or a code that tells you where in that atom it is, where in the, the mix of orbitals it is. And it's a set of four quantum numbers. And we're going to go through and define all four of these quantum numbers and talk about what they mean. And then also how you would use it to identify where an electron is or how to take where an electron is and identify what are its four possible quantum numbers. Now this lesson's part of my brand new high school chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. You'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so as I said, quantum numbers, you got a set of four quantum numbers for every electron in an atom, and they're always going to be different, it turns out. So the Pauli exclusion principle says that no two electrons in an atom will have the same four quantum numbers. So because if you did, like let's say we had two electrons down here, filling them in properly, they have to end up with opposite spins. Turns out one of your quantum numbers is a spin quantum number, because if you put them with the same spin in the same orbital, what that ultimately means is they have the same address in the atom, the same exact orbital with the same exact spin, which is impossible. Pauli exclusion principle says you cannot have the same four quantum numbers uh, for two electrons in an atom. What that really means is you can't have two electrons in the same orbital with the same spin. It's a violation of the Pauli exclusion principle. So you should know what that looks like diagrammatically from this standpoint. So, but now we got to get into what these quantum numbers are and how they give you an electron's address in some form of code. Now, let's say I want to give you my personal address in some form of code. And so I said, I live in state number 48. That's the first part of the code. And if you figure out the code, you might figure out, oh, Chad lives in Arizona because Arizona was the 48th state to become a state. Only Alaska and Hawaii came later. Okay, so there's the first part of the code. And then if I might say, I live in city number nine, and I have no idea if, I have no idea if that's actually corresponds to reality, but you might be like, oh, Chad lives in Tempe, Arizona, the ninth city in Arizona to be formed or whatever, you know? And, and then I might be like, I live in street number 47. And then you figure out what street I live on. And then I give you my house number, the last part of the code. And those four parts of that code, house number, street, city, state, is enough to get my personal address. Well, that's what these four quantum numbers are going to do for an electron as well. They're going to give you a code in kind of code form to give you an electron's address in an atom. And it turns out these four quantum numbers are represented by letters. And notice you might be like, oh, Chad, you told me they're quantum numbers, but you're giving me letters. Well, notice like pi, the Greek letter pi, it's a letter, represents a number, 3.14159, ah, da, 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 you know, so on and so forth. So it's not completely foreign that we represent numbers with letters like pi, for instance. So same thing here. The principal quantum number is n. And that's the same n we saw at the very first lesson in this chapter, like n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, which Bohr thought corresponded to those circular orbits. So, But in our case, actually corresponds to the shell, like the first shell, second shell, third shell, fourth shell, so on and so forth. That's actually what that principal quantum number means. So there's n and there's where n is 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if an electron were anywhere in this fourth shell, whether that be in the s, p, d, or f subshell, its n value for that electron would be 4. Its principal quantum number would be 4. And so that's what the principal quantum number tells you. It effectively gives you the shell number for that electron. All right, next quantum number is L. We call it the azimuthal quantum number. Sometimes it's called the angular momentum quantum number, but you'll see azimuthal used pretty commonly here. And what this ultimately tells you, it's gonna tell you which subshell you're in. Are you in an S subshell, a P subshell, a D subshell, or an F subshell? That's what L ultimately tells you. And so if we look here at L, when L equals zero, that means you're in an S subshell. That's the code. When L equals one, that means you're in a P subshell. When L equals two, you're in a D subshell. And when L equals three, you're in an F subshell. It's just a code. So if I say N equals three, well, then you know you're somewhere here. And if I say L equals zero, well, then you know it's that one right there, the 3S orbital. N equals three, L equals zero, that's a 3S orbital. That's where you're gonna find that electron. Cool. So what if instead I'd said N equals three and L equals one? Well, n equals 3 still means I'm somewhere in the 3s, 3p, or 3d, but l equaling 1 is code for a p orbital. And so now all of a sudden I'd be in a 3p orbital. Well, there are three of them, though. 
which one am I in? Well, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't give you enough code. So I got to go to the next level of code. So you might know the state and the city, but what street do you live on is kind of the analogy here. So in this case, if we look, the next quantum number is the magnetic quantum number. M sub L is the way we say that. So M sub L, the magnetic quantum number, tells you which orbital you're in. Now, if you recall, like your P orbitals, you had PX, PY, and PZ. And they all looked like dumbbell shaped, just what they varied was what axis they were on. And so we often say that your magnetic quantum number is going to tell you the orientation in space. And by telling you the orientation in space, i.e. if you're on the x-axis, the y-axis, or the z-axis, as far as a p-orbital is concerned, it's telling you which specific orbital in that subshell we're talking about. Cool. So that's ultimately what M sub L is going to tell us. And we'll come back to that in a second. And then finally, we've got the spin quantum number. So, and in this case, that's really just telling us if we got spin up or spin down, so to speak. Now, if we look at the possible values that these can have, so this will be instructive. So the lowest principal quantum number you can have is one, because you have the first shell and then you keep going. And you might recall with Bohr, like obviously I've only got four shells showing here, but Bohr's model of the atom with those circular orbits, we said that there actually were an infinite number of those orbits. And so the range of values we can take for that principal quantum number is as low as one all the way up to infinity. Can't be zero, can't be any negative numbers. There's no zero shell or negative shells or anything, but it can start at one and goes all the way up to infinity. That's the possibilities. Now, L on the other hand, the lowest L is ever going to be is zero. That's always a possibility, but it could be as big as zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, for the G orbitals, H orbitals, we said we weren't gonna talk about, I'm not talking about them again. So. The question though is, it depends on what shell you're in. If n equals one and you're in the first shell, well then the only possible value L could have is zero. Because the only thing that exists in the first shell is an S subshell. If you were in n, n equals two, well then you could be in an S subshell or a P subshell, and so L could equal zero or one. If you were in the third shell, then you could have an S, P, or D subshell, and so L could be zero, one, or two. In shell number four, L could be zero, one, two, or three. So it all depends on which shell you're in. And so we can actually define it in terms of N then. It turns out that we can start out as low as zero, everybody's got an S subshell, and the maximum it could be is N minus one. That's the biggest it can be. And so let's say if N is three, well, if N is three, three minus one is two, then this is gonna take on every integer value from zero up to a maximum of two. And that's why in the third shell, it could be zero, one, or two, corresponding to S, P, or D subshells. All right, so that's the range of values for L, our azimuthal quantum number. Now the magnetic quantum number, so just like L is bounded by what N you have, M sub L is gonna be determined by what L you have, it turns out. So the range of values it takes are integer values from negative L to positive L. So for example, let's say that we said L was one. So if L's one, that means you're somewhere in a P subshell and you've got three orbitals, whether it be two P, three P, four P, you still got three orbitals in that particular P subshell. And so M sub L is supposed to identify which specific orbital you have. Well, again, if you're in a P subshell, L equaled one. And if you're gonna have a range of values from negative L to positive L for M sub L here, that would be negative one, zero, and positive one, all the integer values in that range. That's three different values, negative one, zero, and positive one, one for each orbital. And whether that's negative one, zero, and plus one, the order doesn't matter. It could be zero plus one minus one. So plus one, zero, minus one, it's any order. We don't actually go so far as to identify which orbital in our diagram actually corresponds to which M sub L value. So if I gave you an electron that was say right here, well, that's in a two P subshell. So you'd know that N equals two. N equals two, principal quantum number, you know that. But because it's in a P subshell, you also know that L equals one. But you wouldn't actually know what M sub L value it has. What you would know is that it's either negative one, zero, or positive one. You don't know which one, but it's any one of those three. It could not be negative two or positive two or negative three or positive three because it's gotta be bounded. When L equals one, it's gotta be somewhere between negative one and positive one. Notice if instead of being in a P subshell, let's say it had been in a D subshell instead. Well, notice for this electron, we're in the fourth shell, and so N equals four. 
And being in a D subshell, L equals 2. And with L equaling 2, that means M sub L could go from negative 2 to positive 2. That's negative 1. I'm sorry, that's negative 2, negative 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2. Five different values because there are five different orbitals. Now that electron right there, I know that n equals 4, and I know that l equals 2 because it's a d subshell, but as far as m sub l, I know it could be negative 2, negative 1, 0, plus 1, or plus 2, but we don't know which one. We never go again so far as to identify which orbital in this range corresponds to which m sub l value. So at, once you get to m sub l, you can't actually predict a single value. You have to predict a range of values. The only time you can actually predict a single value is if you're in an s subshell. Because let's say you're, you know, instead of being in the 4Ds, let's just say we had been right there, 2s subshell. Well, n equals 2, l equals 0, and if l is 0, then m sub l can take on values from negative 0 to positive 0, which means it's going to be 0. So that's the only time you could actually identify m sub l as being 0, is if you're in an s subshell, you only need one value for m sub l, and it's 0. So life is good. Finally, m sub s is your spin quantum number, and it turns out there's only two values here that we can have. We can take on negative 1 half or plus 1 half. And this is not intuitive. I haven't shown you how these are derived. It turns out there's a whole lot of math involving, say, linear algebra and differential equations that these just kind of naturally fall out of some equations and stuff, and we don't care. I'm just telling you a way to memorize them here. So, but it turns out that m sub s can only take on a value of negative 1 half to positive 1 half. This is actually what we represent it like spin up and spin down. And just like with m sub l, we never define which orbital m sub l corresponds to, we also don't define which spin corresponds to negative 1 half and positive 1 half. It's not like spin up is the plus 1 and spin down is the minus 1. It's just we have two opposites, one's up and one's down. Whether he's up or down doesn't matter, and he's just the opposite. But we never go so far as to define it. So notice I drew the arrow up, but that doesn't tell me which one of these it is. It could be the minus 1 half, it could be the plus 1 half, we just don't know. Cool, and that's the way this kind of works. So you might get a question that ad identifies a particular electron and says, which of the following could be a set of quantum numbers for it? So, and this might be the way this is kind of phrased. Instead of actually giving you a diagram, what they might do instead is say, hey, a valence electron in, say, sodium. Which of the following could be a set of quantum numbers for the valence electron in sodium? Well, sodium's atomic number 11. And so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And so the valence electron, the highest energy shell here, is the third shell. And that's the only valence electron it has. So when we say valence electron for sodium, it has to be him. And in this case, we could give a, a set of quantum numbers, and often we do it in brackets, n, comma, l, comma, m sub l, comma, m sub s. And in this case, which of these do we concretely know? Well, we know n, for that electron, that valence electron, it has to be 3. We also know l, because for an s subshell, l is 0. Okay. We also know m sub l because when you're in an s subshell and l is 0, then m sub l is going to take on values from negative 0 to positive 0, which means just 0. But we don't know m sub s. We know it's either plus 1 half or minus 1 half. It could be either one. And so all of a sudden, there's two possible correct answers. The one I just wrote, or the same one but with negative 1 half as the last choice there. And so they might give you a question that says, which of the following could be a possible set of four quantum numbers for a valence electron in sodium? That would be a possibility. Cool. Those are the kind of questions you might see in the context of quantum numbers. And again, you just have to understand how to kind of decipher what each of these means. You should know their name, what they tell you, and then the range of values that are possible. And then again, if we identify a particular electron, you should be able to give me a possible set of quantum numbers for that electron. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the best things you can do to help promote the channel. And if you're looking for the study guide that went with this lesson, or if you're looking for quantum number practice problems, check out my premium high school chemistry course on chadsprep.com.